We've now reached that point on the timeline when crypto collectively has fallen asleep a little too long at the will of decentralization and adverse events are going to start happening. There was a reason the first generation of blockchains focused so heavily on decentralization and self-custody. Those were the pillars of the value proposition. Satoshi never asked you to give up custody of your Bitcoin so that you could mine. He never asked you to lock any value whatsoever in any dApp. A big reason for that was to avoid capture by regulators. Decentralization has been the shield up till now that's preserved our freedom. But somewhere along the way, a lot of the blockchain ecosystems got greedy. They accidentally on purpose forgot that it's the decentralization, it's always been the decentralization that allowed those crypto liberties. They gave up a little too much in the name of greed. Now they'll suffer the regulatory consequences of their re-centralization of crypto. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss all of the debate that's happening in the crypto world over what will and will not be regulated soon, some brutal reported exploits of FTX customers, just the metrics on Aptos, the possibility of an ADAS spot market on FTX, and Shahaf Bar Geffen on how you might interact with your descendants one day. If your first thought when you saw this image was, hey bro, I've seen this guy at night, it doesn't look like this at all. This is a fake image to go along with your fake YouTube Cardano news. Don't worry. I think it's just supposed to be a long exposure. Or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool ticker AOS. It looks like the larger crypto world is still wrestling with the fallout from the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act. We went through that series of events involving BitBoy and Sam Bankman-Fried and certain personalities in Ethereum. Now we've gotten past that and people are starting to get down to what I think are the really important fine-grained details. And things are not looking good for DeFi in the US, unfortunately. Here, crypto attorney Gabriel Shapiro says, and he's citing a thread that Sam Bankman Free put out, sort of following all the drama and chaos. He put out another thread, I think, in the hopes of further explaining some of the things he wrote about in his suggested crypto regulatory policies that enraged a lot of people. So, Gabriel Shapiro says, the trick here is that he's citing FTX and Fidelity as examples of centralized. But he also seemingly thinks any block explorer JSON object generator is centralized. If any aspect of it is hosted by anyone anywhere, mere websites must not be regulated broker dealers. He goes on to say, Etherscan must not be required to be registered as a broker dealer merely because it facilitates trades by displaying data and helping generate a JSON object. Same is true of more specialized block explorers that pertain to more limited data. SBF says, so if you look at the updated blog post, I actually call out Ether Etherscan explicitly as something that shouldn't count. Thanks for pointing out that my prior language could have been read that way. So I think Gabriel Shapiro has a very good point here. There's this old trick. The you know regulating entity comes along and says, "Hey, um, if any canine is seen in the streets, it should be shot and can be shot by any citizen." And then they say, "As an example, if there's a wolf in your neighborhood, you should shoot it." And then the citizens think about this regulation and they say, "Hey, you used a wolf as the example, and yeah, maybe." If, you know, wolves are trying to take down our children, probably we should kill the wolves. But the actual rule you laid out there is that any canine seen in the street can be shot. So am I going to have people taking shots at my lab when I take it on walks? Because it'll, it'll be in the street and it's a canine. This is the kind of problem we don't want to have. You can lay out a very general rule and then give examples that are very specific that nobody would really disagree with. And here, the way it worked was that a very generalized rule was laid out that would take in a whole bunch 
of different types of crypto websites. And then the example given was, you know, like FTX and Fidelity. And if we look at SBF's sort of draft regulatory proposals, the ones that he said were revised and the ones he directed Gabriel Shapiro to in light of Gabriel's comment, we see this, what this would mean, the following activities would potentially require some license registration, et cetera. An American hosting a website on, for example, AWS that actively provides a front end that encourages and facilitates US retail users to trade on decentralized protocols actively marketing DeFi products to US retail investors. And then we come down here to some examples. If you host a website aimed at facilitating and encouraging US retail to connect to and trade on a DEX, this may end up falling under something like a broker dealer, FCM, etc. You may also potentially have KYC obligations. To be clear, this is separate from generalized tooling for on-chain parsing and interfacing, e.g. Etherscan. <laughs> So, so we've got sort of a recommendation for a whole, you know, uh, like widespread registration as broker dealers, basically for any website aimed at facilitating and encouraging us retail to connect to and trade on a DEX. So you, there are a lot of different things that we do in crypto that could be painted as, you know, encouraging, encouraging retail to make trades and you know it's pretty easy to say that you're encouraging them to make trades on a dex unless you're specifically sending them to centralized exchanges you know you're probably encouraging that that kind of behavior would probably be called encouraging dex trading but then he throws on this little thing at the end this is separate from generalized tooling for on-chain parsing and interfacing there's a pro for example etherscan there's a problem with trying to write regulatory policy this way he's given the one extreme example and called that generalized tooling for on-chain parsing and interfacing but who gets to make the decision what's generalized tooling for on-chain parsing and interfacing and what's you know more specific tooling for on-chain parsing and interfacing and what DeFi activities are going to be deemed not on-chain parsing and interfacing and what are so Gabe points this out right here. He says, but every DeFi website is just a specialized version of Etherscan. I don't see how you can coherently draw the line between them. This is, this is important. He's pointing out this is all a line drawing exercise, and that's not the kind of ambiguity we're looking for. SBF says, in the end, there isn't an extremely clear line, and that sucks, but it's also the truth. For some extremes, Etherscan isn't a broker. But if Robinhood routed some of its ETH to a DEX, it'd still have to KYC its users. That's not the kind of distinction that's helpful to us here because pretty much all of DeFi falls somewhere in between here. This is like saying, this is like the, in our, in our little, uh, example about, uh, the canine, canine regulations in the street. This is like saying, Hey, look, it's not that we're going to go after your lab. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that chihuahuas are not canines that can be shot in the street. On the other hand, wolves eating your children can be shot. That leaves the entire world of canines in between those two. What you need to be able to say is, hey, here's the line. Otherwise, this kind of ambiguity, you know what regulators do when they have this kind of ambiguity between two extremes like this? They push it all the way to this extreme. They're going to push it until it's like everything but ether scan. Everything but something that's exactly like Etherscan is on our regulatory radar. That's what happens. That's why you can't have, I hate to say this, but you can't have non-lawyers writing regulatory policy like this. I mean, you can, but these kinds of details, these kinds of legal details need to be need to be hashed out. These fine grain details need to be dealt with. You can't just randomly say, here's the policy. Etherscan's cool and Robinhood's definitely bad. Those are the extremes because like in our example before, the entire world of canines is in between those two. So what is probably the right line to draw? Well, this commentator who apparently is a former Ethereum core developer had this to say, where exactly do you draw the line? I don't know. The line seems clear. If you custody your user's funds, and the activity isn't transparent and on chain, then you're a broker. Otherwise, you're not a broker. 
And this was in comment to exactly the conversation I just showed you. The problem is what would be a good paradigm for regulation is not often exactly what we get out of regulators. So what will we get? I think custody is going to be one of those things that's really easy to delineate. Regulators tend to like either things that give them all the discretion or things that are very black and white, they are very easy to, to determine. I think custody is going to be one of those things, even though we can get into some weird exotic territory where custody becomes kind of unclear in DeFi, I think for regulators coming from the traditional finance world, custody is going to be one of those things that's very easy for them. They're going to think it's going to be very easy for them to delineate and it's easy for them to talk about and they're familiar with it from the traditional finance world so i think custody is going to be a very big deal and it's very easy to say that the centralized exchanges have a very different level of custody than a lot of DeFi platforms and in the case of the DeFi platforms we have a totally different problem and that problem is that you do as the user you often are giving up custody it's just that you're giving it up to the protocol and the protocol is usually being run often being run by a DAO or something. The problem there is that we have this, this thing going on in the Uki DAO case where the CFTC came along and said, oh yeah, we're going to hold the original lab liable for what they launched. And, and uh, their handoff to the DAO means that the DAO is now running it. So we're going to hold the DAO responsible. And, you know, the next question is, do they go after the voters who have been involved with the DAO, people holding the governance tokens who actually voted? We've talked about that on this channel. But it's kind of a big problem because the custody thing, we can say, hey, giving up your own custody and depositing your funds in a smart contract address in the case of the EVM world, that's still a loss of custody. Something or someone has that custody. And if the regulatory world follows the lead of the CFTC in the Ukidao case, they're going to go ahead and hang that on the labs that set up the protocol and the DAOs that inherited the protocol from those labs. So I mean, there is a path here for regulators to take in all of DeFi to say that all of DeFi is composed of entities that should be registering as broker dealers. And, and that's not even addressing all of the other things a regulator like the SEC could get into. They could go or so the SEC could come along and say, hey, if you're a DEX, uh, we're going to call, you know, between one and 100% of your asset securities and say you're an unregistered securities exchange. The CFTC can come along and in something similar to the Ukidao case, they could say, hey, uh, you seem to have a trading platform here. And we're saying that, you know, between one and 100% of your asset of the assets on your trading platform are commodities. So whether you think you're the assets you're dealing with fall in the commodities camp or the securities camp, Either one could say you need to register with the relevant regulatory authority. So what does that leave in DeFi? What part of DeFi is left when we've got these custody issues and then we've got the registration issues related to pretty much anything dealing with commodities or securities? What about the free speech argument that's always put forward? What if we have this hypothetical case where someone someone creates a whole protocol and they just publish the code and they don't become the labs entity that actually launches the protocol. They just publish the protocol on the chain. They don't have their front end. They don't have their own front end to run the protocol. They just publish the smart, they just deploy the smart contract to the chain. They publish the smart contract in the parlance of this free speech argument. The problem here then even if we can convince the entire regulatory world that that publishing of the code is just free speech and perfectly fine, anybody who creates a front end and runs a front end for that, I think the regulators are going to, US regulators are going to come down and say, hey, if you are a US resident or citizen, or 
if you are running it via a cloud service, a server service in the US, we're going to come down on either you or we're going to go to the to the uh, to the server company and we're going to make them quit hosting your front end. And you know, maybe in some cases even if you're abroad, if you're not in the US, if the entity becomes big enough, I could see the US regulators going to their counterparts. If you're in a friendly country, a country that's friendly to the US, the US federal regulators go to the regulators in your country and they ask them nicely to make you stop servicing US customers. This is a pretty huge problem for DeFi. And right now we're kind of back in the crypto world, we're kind of acting like, of course, a reasonable approach is going to be taken. Of course, they're not just going to pull in all of DeFi and make everybody register. But when you look at the way regulators start regulating a new industry or a new type of product, usually what they do is they take as much jurisdiction as they can. In fact, regulators get into fights over who has jurisdiction over blank thing. They're going to take as much jurisdiction as they possibly can. So during all this policy formation stage, if things don't get set up with some with some pretty serious some pretty serious lines if we don't have some boundaries set up right from the start if we can't convince congress basically to set out some boundaries for the regulators the regulators are going to take everything they can the custody thing the the dow as a target of regulators um the securities or commodity status of the assets they're dealing with there's the potential for the regulators to pull in the entire DeFi industry. And a big, a big piece of this is the fault of the DeFi industry and the blockchain ecosystems that went down the route of having users give up self-custody. And I, I know, I know there's a lot of DeFi utility that can only be had, at least so far, the way we do things so far, that can only be had by giving up custody. Obviously, you can't provide liquidity. If you're not providing that liquidity, you need to actually provide it to the protocol in order for that utility or in order for that liquidity to be, you know, to have some utility for other users. So I get that there's certain things that require relinquishing custody, but by going down that road and by going down the ro this road where we lose decentralization, where we have the front ends of gigantic DeFi protocols being run on servers as centralized websites all of these things collectively have led us to this road where this entire gigantic chunk of crypto that we call DeFi could be captured by regulators maybe we do exactly the right things from here going forward maybe we go down exactly the right road with the u.s congress and they somehow lay down that heavy black black and white line and tell the regulators, you can regulate right up to here, but no further. Maybe we get lucky and that happens, but it could go the other way. Because we've gone too far in the direction of surrendering self-custody, surrendering decentralization. So much of crypto, at least in this one area, DeFi, has been re-centralized from where we were at the advent of crypto. We can't really blame anybody but ourselves if we lose all of DeFi is lost to regulation. That's really our fault for going down this road where we relinquished self custody and decentralization and re-centralized this giant chunk of crypto. Speaking of the dangers of centralization, we saw some posts from some people saying they were FTX users, speaking of Sam Bankman Freed, and reporting things like this. My name is Bruce, and I am one of the victims of the three commas API exploit on FTX. I lost about 1.5 million US dollars in the attack, counting the market value of BTC. It happened on the 21st in Beijing time. 1.5 million US dollars. This is a single user reporting this. So who is three commas? Three commas says they are the largest crypto trading software providing traders with ultimate control over their positions on most exchanges. I think these people who lost their funds do not feel like they had ultimate control 
over anything. <laughs> Three comments says, we investigated reports that some users accounts, some user accounts were compromised and investigated with FTX. We found the issue is likely related to phishing. Please read more here. I've looked at this little uh, blog article. It seems like they're alleging that the attackers were able to acquire these users API keys via phishing, which is something that some of the users who lost assets seem to be challenging. Like this one, he's, this person says, I will, I will not be deceived by phishing websites. It's your own safety. I lost 2 million in this attack. So we have one user saying they lost 1.5 million. This user saying they lost 2 million in this attack. However, they lost the money. This is maybe this is just me, but if I were a person who had millions of dollars of crypto in any account, I definitely would not be keeping that on a centralized exchange. And I definitely would be keeping it on a ledger. You don't have to use a ledger, but some hardware wallet. If you don't have a hardware wallet, there's a link for ledgers in the description box below. It's an affiliate link, so I make some kind of small commission if you buy one through that link. but you should buy a hardware wallet somewhere, some type of quality hardware wallet if you're keeping this amount of money in any crypto account anywhere. Because if you have a hardware wallet and you do find yourself the victim of a phishing attack or some other attack, as long as you don't push that little button on your, on your hardware wallet, on your ledger device, for instance, the money won't leave your account. Unless you give up, give up your private keys, which, which, I would hope you wouldn't do, but in the case of some of these phishing attacks, that's maybe what happened. But if you don't give up your private keys, then you pretty much have to push that little button on your ledger device for the funds to go anywhere. And that can prevent a lot of these attacks. It turns out that even Ada and Cardano are not off the radar of Sam Bankman Freed. He made this response to this post. This post is basically asking the question, why is it that Cardano is not present on FTX? And I think when people ask this question, they're really asking about an ADA spot market. And SBF responded that we have ADA 2 on our roadmap. Adding spot ADA is on the roadmap. So at some point in the future, who knows when this could happen, but it's always been this glaring gap that ADA was not on FTX. I personally kind of like it because I don't know if it really does the ecosystem that much good because centralized exchanges are, they are often in favor of starting up a huge number of stake pools that hurt the Nakamoto coefficient, the uh, decentralization of our network. People say, oh, this is good because we have a new fiat on-ramp, but I think the amount of harm done by the mega multi-stake pool operating that a lot of these centralized exchanges do, that probably outweighs the good of having another fiat on-ramp. But instead of putting your money on FTX, if you're like those people from the exploit, if you have millions of dollars of ADA, maybe don't put it on FTX. Maybe instead just throw it on a ledger. More bad news for those who chose the path of recentralization of their blockchains. Suraj and Laura have an article just about Aptos. Suraj says, blockchains enable digitalization of assets in a transparent and inclusive way. That's why chains like Cardano will be the future of global finance. But blockchains have zero value without decentralization. I agree with this. That's why we are talking about Aptos today. You should go check out this article. I love that Laura and Suraj always examine everything through the through the lens of the blockchain trilemma, security, scalability, and decentralization. But just to give you a taste of how centralized Aptos is, look at a couple of items. This first one involves the tokenomics of both Aptos and Cardano. Cardano famously had this 81% public sell, only 17% went to insiders, and 2% to the foundation. Aptos, on the other hand, had it has a distribution, a distribution where 78% went to the went to the hands of insiders, 20% went to the foundation, and 2% went to ecosystem funds or airdrops. Yes, that's right. 78% according to this went to insiders. If we think about their validators, 
then maybe they're decentralized on the validator front. Nope. With 100% of initial token distribution and 100% of validators belonging to the insiders of the Aptos blockchain, on top of that, you must sign an arbitration agreement in the Cayman Islands to be included in the validator set. So very much not permissionlessness, very much not in the realm of permissionlessness. This poster says there are no community run permissionless validators. All 101 validators were handpicked by Aptos Labs slash foundation. You had to sign an arbitration agreement in the Cayman Islands to be included in the validator set. So just a couple of items that indicate that even brand new blockchains, I mean, not only are they not surpassing the level of decentralization of blockchains like Cardano and Ethereum and Bitcoin, they're actually reaching new heights in terms of recentralizing crypto. Aptos, you guys deserve an F minus in decentralization. But finishing on a positive note, I really liked this little thread from Shahaf Bargeffin of Koti. He says, when you're gone, AI may replace you, allowing your loved ones and future generations to have conversations with you. If you have missed the AI powered podcast of Joe Rogan interviewing the deceased Steve Jobs, then go ahead and listen now and he gives you a link there. I haven't watched this. If you've watched this, this AI interview of Joe Rogan by Joe, uh, I guess Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs, let me know, is this good or am I going to be able to tell it's fake? Let me know. Is this convincing or will I know it's fake? Cause I'll probably end up watching it unless you guys tell me it's super fake. Shahaf Bargeffin says, this was made possible by an AI processing everything available online from Joe Rogan and Steve Jobs, then creating both the conversation and their voices. This is truly amazing as it actually generated an insightful conversation. We're now at the tipping point of generative AI with image in Dali, video in Synthesia, voice in Play.ht, articles, write Sonic, and more. Just imagine being able to consult with an AI version of someone you admire or your grand grandkids conversing with an AIU. The caveat, AI consumes data. If you'd like to have an AIU, you need to write and record a lot. If you want the AI to be permissioned, feed it to yourself. If you'd like it to be permissionless, post online, hence this. I've heard this um, this kind of thesis before that you know maybe people should be putting out a lot of content, a lot of self-generated content, so that one day a good AI version of themselves could be created. And this has to do obviously with the sound of your voice and the content of your speech, your thought patterns, all those things. And I can certainly imagine how with someone like Joe Rogan, we have this incredible amount of content that he's generated that exhibits all of those qualities, his manner of speaking, the kinds of things he thinks about, his diction, word choice, all of these things. And I'm sure you can create a very convincing AI Joe Rogan now and in the future that will only become better. I think all of us can imagine certain of our relatives and ancestors who we maybe wish we had an AI version of. Of course, dystopian movies have been made about this kind of thing. But uh, for myself, I think I would like to have that uh, in the case of, of some of my relatives who are no longer around. So. It's going to be an interesting future, I think, but I hope everybody had a great weekend and I'll talk to you tomorrow.